Aloha and welcome to the May Hawaii Public Health Training Hui webinar, Training of Facilitators 101. My name is Steph Moyer and I'm the Community Initiatives and Training Coordinator for the Hawaii Public Health Institute. Before we get started, we'd like to go over some Zoom housekeeping. I'd like to acknowledge the organizers of this training, uh, myself, Makamai Namahoe, HiFi's Public Health Programs Associate, and also acknowledge the Hawaii Public Health Training Hui Steering Committee. For all questions, please utilize the chat box or Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. All webinars are recorded and will be available on the Hawaii Public Health Training Hui's YouTube channel. We'd like to thank our sponsors and partners for today's training, the Hawaii Public Health Training Hui, the Western Region Public Health Training Center, and the Public Health Learning Network. If you are seeking continuing education credits, um, please note that these are the four areas we are providing credits for for today's training. We are offering it for CHES, registered diet dietitians, uh, social work, as well as substance abuse counselors. In order to receive your continuing education credits, you must register and attend the live webinar. Following today's webinar, I will send you a link to a evaluation survey, and this survey must be completed by next Monday, which is May 24th. Um, if you are attending the webinar today via phone, please note that you do have to send me an email with your name and let me know what phone number you use to join today's webinar. Certificates will be sent out by Friday, June 4th. And if after two weeks you have not received that certificate, please feel free to send either myself or Maka an email and let us know. Now it's my honor to introduce you to our guest speakers today. Our first speaker is Heather Lusk. Heather is the Executive Director of the Hawaii Health and Harm Reduction Center. She is the co-director and founder of HEP Free Hawaii, a coalition of over 90 agencies in Hawaii working together to eliminate hepatitis in the islands. Heather has over 25 years of experience dedicated to reducing health disparities and stigma as it relates to HIV, viral hepatitis, and other chronic conditions linked to substance use. As a board member of the Hawaii Substance Abuse Coalition, as vice chair with Partners in Care, Heather works to support systems integration and the intersection of mental health, substance use, homelessness, chronic health conditions, and the criminal justice system. Our second speaker today is Kunani Dreyer. Kunani is the LGBT Program and Capacity Building Manager at the Hawaii Health and Harm Reduction Center. Kunane is a leader within the LGBTQI community, providing ongoing cultural humility trainings to service providers. He is experienced as a respect counseling, outreach testing and linkage, and rapid testing trainer. Kunane served as the director of HIV, excuse me, HIV prevention services at Life Foundation since 2006 and has experience working with prevention intervention strategies, PREP navigation, linkage to care, and prevention for positives. He has completed the Institute for HIV Prevention Leadership Program and serves as a member of the Hawaii Community Planning Group. Kunane is a recipient of the Pacific Business News 2019 Business of Pride Award. Kunane continues to develop and foster various trainings at HHHRC to, to build capacity of service providers across Hawaii and the Pacific to better serve and support our most vulnerable populations. Now, without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Heather. Great, thank you so much, Stephanie. Uh, thank you to, the, to Hi Fi for having us today. Um, could folks see my slides on the screen? Yes. 
All right. So again, my name is Heather, and I'm blessed to be with the Hawaii Health and Harm Reduction Center. And uh, Kunane and I, um, actually, I was thinking about it, Kunane, I believe that we've been training together for over 15 years, if you include the work um, when I was at the health department. So I'm really thrilled to be doing this training, particularly with Kunane today. Um, both of us have some experience in doing professional training, um, but like you all, we've had to take everything to the virtual realm the last year. So we're going to share some lessons learned that we have through the um, HHHRC Training Institute on, um, on facilitating, but also doing a highlight of doing this in the virtual environment like we are today. So as Steph mentioned, the Hawaii Health and Harm Reduction Center works at the intersection of criminal justice, chronic diseases like HIV, mental health, substance use, and houselessness. We have a no wrong door approach in really working uh, with communities to reduce harm, promote health, create wellness, and fight stigma in Hawaii and the Pacific. Um, in the middle here of our mission statement, you see that we, while we focus on those disproportionately affected by the social determinants of health, uh, specifically people living with HIV, the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and uh, trans communities, and the Native Hawaiian communities, we turn nobody away and all of our services are free. Just uh, to ground, um, for those of you that are not familiar with H3RC, we are the result of the merge of the Life Foundation, the largest and oldest HIV organization, and the Chow Project, the statewide harm reduction and syringe exchange programs, both of which had over 30 years in Hawaii, and we merged in 2018. And we really have a, a value foundation through which we do our work. And part of the reason I share this is I truly invite you, I see several folks we know and allies of H3RC as we're commonly known in the participant list and actually really encourage you to communicate with us and give us feedback. Not only in the, the core values like the ones you see here that we do uh, and try to honor, but particularly this last one here, integrity. Meaning as a director, I um, actively invite feedback about are we walking our talk? Are we exhibiting our values and all of the ways that we deliver services to our individual, to the community, and to other providers like yourselves that we share um, um, patients and, and consumers of our services? So really do invite you um, both for this training specifically, we'll get your feedback on the evaluation, but we really do value feedback, um, especially around that, that integrity. Are we doing what we say we're going to do? Because as I think you all know, that's really important in the work that we do. Lastly, if you haven't, um, if you aren't as familiar with our agency, you can visit us at hhhrc.org. We do a lot of street-based services. In fact, we're about to launch our medical mobile unit onto the streets in just about a week, where we'll be taking many of these services into some of the more rural parts of Oahu. And then we do have a clinic here in Kaka'ako, uh, and most of our services have uh, referrals on our website, and we do what's called a warm handoff, where if you see a star here, that often means we can provide uh, wraparound services, transportation. Um, so for example, people living with HIV, um, people that identify as transgender, and other folks that access our services, we can really provide wraparound. Um, so please do not hesitate to reach out and learn more about our services and refer your clients. But why we're here today is to share again a bit of our um, experience, but also hopefully to hear from you about how can we make facilitation, especially in a virtual environment, as dynamic, inclusive, and meaningful as possible. So our goals today are to um, hopefully increase even a little bit uh, the capacity to deliver and facilitate trainings both in person and online to learn a bit about adult learning styles and add to your existing knowledge on how to make diversity in activities or ways of learning, to increase, um, again, specific skills in uh, being able to manage and include people in discussions. We're going to spend a little bit of time talking about those, those challenging participants uh, and how, and hopefully we don't have any online right now, none of you would be giving us a hard time today, no. uh, but to talk about those that are too quiet or too, or talk a lot or are trying to hijack the session, how do we manage those? Um, and then lastly, um, really try to hone in on some of those tips and tricks that Hunana and I, and, and I'm sure many of you have learned over the past year, as it seems like our entire li lives have gone online. Um, and uh, particularly to be able to kind of highlight some of the benefits of being online, but also some of the challenges. So we're gonna try to uh, use a couple of our tools here. Um, and so what I'm going to ask you to do is you take out your smartphone, please. I think most of you have them. And I'm going to ask you to go to www.menti.com. 
and it's going to ask you to put in a code. Our code is right here. It's 25136560. We'll give you a couple of seconds to do that. Obviously, you can do it on your computer as well, but uh, we find it's even easier on a smartphone. Once you get to menti.com and put in that number, you should see this question. Do you prefer in-person or virtual learning or virtual as a facilitator? Um, so for those of you done facilitation, would you like it in person or have you adapted and adopted this new, the not really new, but definitely more accessible platform, whether it's Zoom, WebEx or any of those? So I'm gonna go ahead, whoops, sorry, Kunane, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen as uh, Kunane is going to bring up Menti. Again, the 25136560 is the number to get into uh, the Menti. I'm gonna stop sharing for a moment because then Kunane is gonna bring up the Menti, uh, the Menti uh, website. And this is a really easy tool that you can utilize in trainings. Um, so we can actually see live uh, what the folks are doing. So we have about 105 folks on uh, the webinar today. Thank you again for joining us. And so we have about half of you that have participated. So again, you'll see the code here at the top 2513-6560. The rest of you, if you could take a moment to jump on over to menti.com, see, see where you're at with uh, both virtual and in-person learning. Well, interesting, Kunane. Yeah, we have, um, I don't know, Kunane, where do you sit? I'm still in person, I'll be honest. I, I would still put myself in the in-person, but look at this, most of our folks like both. Where would you put yourself, Kunane? So I prefer in person, but a lot of the things that we learn during this virtual year, um, we could then start to use or maybe implement and mix into the in-person trainings. Like this mentee can be used um, at an in-person training also to poll the group and get them involved. Right, because then you just put, the, as long as you have Wi-Fi, right? You just put this up on the screen instead of the PowerPoint in the training room and yeah, same, same. So given this, I would love for folks to, um, and look, someone already did, I would love for anybody who wants to chat, what do you like about both? What, what do you like about virtual or what do you like about in-person? Particularly those of you that put both. We'd love to hear from you. We already heard from, it looks like Ken, Kenneth, one aspect of virtual is that the potential of reaching larger numbers uh, very much. So for, especially for our, we, we have water between our counties, right? So our neighbor island folks often were not able to access our trainings. And I'm sure I have, we have some folks here from the neighbor islands and it really does allow more folks to go. Oh, Kristen says that she really loves the energy when you do in-person facilitations. Oh, Kristen, that's so true. Yeah, Kunani, you can actually, as a facilitator, harness that energy, right? And actually get the group can build excitement and, and it keeps people awake and it keeps them engaged. It's a lot harder to harness that energy here, especially if people are multitasking, right? Or doing their email. Again, uh, several people saying, I like interfacing with human beings. Oh, and, and Kim has a good point. So sometimes when people cannot make the meeting, Zoom allows it to be recorded easier, right? And watch offline. Yeah. Linda says she likes some of the idea of not driving anywhere. I hear that, Linda. Though I don't know about you all. How many of you have so many more meetings on Zoom than you ever had in person because we took away the driving time? Sorry, Kunande, what were you going to say? Well, I was going to say that the, the name of the person is right under their screen, so it makes it easier they, um, to call on. And it's so true um, in this case, because some of us aren't very good with names, or if you're in a room with 50 people, you don't, you're not going to remember. So this makes it nice to personalize and call on people virtually. Yeah. Yeah, because it does get kind of embarrassing, right, Kunane, to call on to say, hey, you, or to say, remember their name wrong. So it is, you're right, it's a really nice cue. <laughs> we heard from, uh, yeah, I love the numbers, high numbers, but don't miss the driving. It's so true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so for being safe, um, really, I think that's a really good point. I think that's, I can't tell if that's Vicky, looks like, um, but yeah, that it can create safety for people as well. Um, you get to know people more in person, so true. 
Oh, and a yeah, a really good point here um, is it, talking about how, so both Kunane, I do have double screens, don't we, Kunane, when we're presenting, yeah. because you can then read a script, and it may not seem like you're reading it, or you can, you know, you can really get a lot, it's a lot easier to look at cues where, I don't know about y'all, but when I'm in front of a group, I can have my notes, but it's more awkward, and it's more obvious when your notes are driving, so it's true that your virtual can really give you that flexibility. Yeah, breakout rooms. People say more access to training. Yeah. This is Steph. I'm just going to jump in real quick. Um, for those that are chatting in, if you feel comfortable, um, if you want to change the setting on the chat box to panelists and attendees, um, that way other folks in the training also will have access to what you're typing. Um, if you feel more comfortable with just sharing your answers with us as panelists, that's totally fine too. Great, thank you so much. But again, that shows you the nuance, right? Um, Stephanie of Zoom that here's, and we're gonna talk about that. So we're in a webinar platform, which is different than the meeting platform. Um, so for example, we can't see you all the way we would, might otherwise. So normally I'd say, for example, please put on your cameras, but you know, or things like that, Do you're, is it, you can disable the chat. So uh, Kunane and I um, did a, a conference that had um, 500 people at it and well, except for the one time we forgot Kunani to disable the chat. That was a little bit of a nightmare. But overall, you know, with 500 people, you don't want everyone to read the chats because you don't want the panelists to be distracted necessarily. So these are all the kind of um, nuances that you have access to with online. All right, Kunane, I'm gonna have you stop sharing if you don't mind and get back to the piece. But thank you all for the great comments. Let me just make sure that we mentioned most of them. Um, people are more, uh, more likely to engage via chat, maybe especially some folks that are quieter. We also have technology issues. So how many of you have been on a Zoom and either the, you or the panelist has technology issues? We sometimes have that here with unstable internet. Um, no one has to wear a mask so I can see expressions. Oh, that's such a good comment. I almost, you almost forget sometimes what people look like without our masks. <laughs> um, oh, people use earphones and be able to hear folks better. Um, and again, that the, the options allow more access to those kind of trainings. All right, well, thank you so much for all of your um, input into these pieces. So uh, we were gonna do breakout rooms, um, but then we discovered that because it's a web, uh, webinar format, it doesn't actually have that breakout function. Uh, several of you mentioned that breakout rooms can make things more um, interesting um, and also more interactive, especially in your large groups where you really, you know, adult learning theory says that the earlier somebody talks and feels safe in a group, the more likely they are to continue to, continue to contribute and be part of it. Um, and especially for folks that are more, um, introverted or quiet, they're kind of seeing, is it safe for me to participate? Um, and these small breakout rooms can really make it that even your shyest person feels like, oh, I have one or two people to talk to. That seems really a lot less daunting than trying to, you know, say something for the entire hundred people to read. So one thing we really encourage, and this is something that Kunane and I do for each other, is we have really honest conversations about where our strengths are in facilitations and maybe some of the areas that we struggle with. So we won't do this right now, but maybe just think for yourself where are you on a scale of one being not very skilled or to five being very skilled in each of these facilitation areas and where do you want to get more support um, in your own facilitation um, practice so once so again I'm going to use kind of a lot of parallels with Kunane and I as we develop this training so we talked talk a bit about a safe space but what does a safe space look like in a virtual setting um, so again, it, it could be something like getting you to chat early on, getting you in small groups. Um, in in-person training, often it's doing that icebreaker um, or that introduction where everybody gets to say who they are and where they're from. It gets more challenging in a group this large. Um, and then what we often call the housekeeping. And I, I love that um, Kunane's come up with some other, some other names for it. So one of them he has is the garden and the garden is kind of like a parking lot, right? Where in traditional, uh, you know, I think of like the easel pages days when I was using markers, we'd have a, a piece of paper up that says, hey, anything you bring up or questions that, that we'll either get to later or aren't relevant now, we're gonna write down and get back to. So um, those kind of pieces can really help people feel more comfortable. Sometimes in an in-person training, you can have post-it notes, right, that you pass out to folks and they can write their questions on that. Um, and then we're really lucky in a, in a, in a in a forum like this that we have Steph um, monitoring the Q&A and the chat for us to see if there's anything coming up that folks want to better discuss. 
Uh, housekeeping is really important. I think you saw Stephanie really model that really well. Um, you know, again, in um, in in person trainings, we may want to talk about where the restrooms are, or if there's a break where you can get refreshments. And then in a group like this, it's harder, but definitely um, anytime you have, um, you know, most most types of meetings, especially if you're meeting an ongoing issue, it's really important to have group agreements. Sometimes they're called um, ground rules. And uh, this is a really a good opportunity to make sure that everybody's on the same page. So um, just take a moment and if you can put into the chat, what are some common group agreements that you have seen utilized in trainings like this? So often we talk about confidentiality, what is said here stays here. Um, another one is a step up, step back, um, meaning if you often talk a lot, maybe step back more. If you're often quiet, step up. Um, one I stole from Kunane is one diva, one mic, um, or also known as one person speaks at a time. Um, so these are some examples, but it does really help to get it from like you all, because again, each group is different and we only we need to not only talk about these agreements, but actually get agreement from the group. Can everybody adhere to the next hour together that we agree to keep what's confidential here, that we ask one person to speak at a time, things like that. So, um, oh, I love that. So someone wrote, don't yuck somebody else's yum. That's also another good one, yeah, kunane. And that's kind of understanding that we all have different ways of things that get us excited. And particularly, uh, I think when kunane and I are facilitating like our HIV or sexually related um, um, trainings, as long as it's consensual, it's not who are we to judge somebody else, yeah. Um, phone, is, phone usage, I think that's a really important one. Do you want people online and checking in during the training or do you want their phones um, kind of put down? Um, do you want, is it okay for them to answer a call or would you rather them go outside if it's in person? Um, using the hands, oh great, somebody talked about using the raise your hand in Zoom. Um, oh, I love that judgment free zone participate with the level that you're comfortable with. Yep. So we got y'all some really good kind of group agreements in here and right to pass no pressure. Oh, that's so important, especially in like right now Kunane and I are, are developing a trauma informed care uh, training and that's a real example of somebody may not want to share or may even have some feelings about what we're presenting and we always want to create a safe space of people to not participate if they don't want to um, and not to um, embarrass them about that. So that's great. So again, it's um, taking the time ahead of time to develop these. And then what about Zoom? First of all, and I think you all know this, Zoom fatigue is real. In fact, we're coming out now with some really interesting studies. Um, I think it was Stanford um, did a deep dive um, into what are the effects of being on, and I'm using Zoom, but it's all WebEx and um, all the different kinds of um, online platforms. But this thing, this idea of not only are we jamming more into our day because we don't travel um, and we aren't doing the talk story with folks that we might do before and after a meeting to make it longer. But many of us, and no disrespect if you're doing this right now, but many of us multitask. How many of you are in a meeting or right now and you're checking your email on the side or you're checking your phone? It's hard not to. But I don't know about y'all, but a, a year of multitasking has put my brain in, in a way that I haven't felt since grad school, <laughs> as far as its ability to kind of bounce back. And that's what the research at Stanford said, was that um, we really need these, these more frequent breaks. So um, some of the things that we did or, or, and that Kunane did is first of all, to check in with Stephanie and say, oh, we're on webinar. Okay, we're not gonna do our breakout room. Um, and then Stephanie let us know, well, she'll be monitoring the Q&A and the chat for us. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Um, you saw that we did our poll and we had to, we had to do that ahead of time. Um, even though Zoom has polls, you really want to do them ahead of time and not to waste your participants' time and energy, you know, in the meeting. And then do you want a waiting room? I'm pretty sure you all went into a waiting room um, because I, I, I actually recommend these because then um, – one is I just went to a conference where the waiting room had a loop of a video, like a, a PowerPoint slide, and that was a really cool way to educate people about topics while they're in the waiting room. But secondly, you don't want to be the one with the hot mic, you know, me telling Kunane, you know, I don't know about what I did last night, and all of a sudden all these participants are coming into the training. So a waiting room really allows you that kind of, um, I don't want to say professional start, but a, a, a monitored and controlled start so that you don't have folks coming in and again, you're saying something or doing something that maybe you didn't really want to broadcast. Um, 
we normally, if we weren't on a meeting, we would ask you to have your, your cameras on. When Kunane and I do trainings for the Alcohol and Drug Abuse Division at DOH, which we do quite a few, we always ask folks to put on their cameras. And the research says that people are more engaged when their cameras are on. Um, but we also understand that people may um, be in crowded areas or be in a place where confidentiality is an issue. And then lastly, um, and this may be controversial because we know sometimes breaks are hard to get people back. But again, the research is saying that if you're on Zoom, you would want to break every hour to hour and a half um, to really give people a chance to stretch and get out of their chair. Or maybe you do exercises with them, like, you know, let's just do a stretch right now um, to kind of get things, the blood moving. But that all these pieces thought about ahead of time is going to make your online, um, your online training that much more um, engaging. So um, thanks, Kunane did a great job of kind of putting up the differences between, and this is Zoom specifically, and again, we know there's many more. Zoom's kind of becoming like Kleenex where we use it for, all, we use it for a generic term for all online when really there's lots of other options. But Zoom is one of the more user-friendly. And so um, what he did here was define meeting. You can, you know, how many folks can you have? Again, you know, you have more control in a webinar to around, um, you can't do breakout rooms, but you can um, disable chat or disable the list if you don't want folks. So let's say, you, again, you don't want a lot of participation, the webinar may be more appropriate. If you want to have a lot of participation, meeting may be, but then it's a lot more logistics, right, to engage and manage all of that participation. Um, and then all of the functions of Zoom um, come in. It's going to take a moment here, Steph, and break, have a break and see what's come up in the chat to see if there's anything. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time pulling it up. Can you read for me? Oh, there it is. Um, oh, yeah, eye strain from the community. So people talking about the eye strain and more muscle aches and shoulders. Yeah, from just staying here. Um, we talked about the hot mic. Oh. I've had, um, I've had a couple of hot mic incidents. Luckily, nothing too bad. But that's something that's really, I think you've seen people lose their jobs um, for having hot mics, um, people especially like politicians and others. Or did anybody see that one where the, where the lawyer was a cat in the, in the um, courtroom by accident because this kid had put a Zoom filter on of him being a cat? And he's like, judge, I'm seriously not a cat. <laughs> so, um, all right. So, um, Again, um, being really mindful about your platform moving forward. So as um, Kunane and I have done several training of trainers or facilitators with our own team here, and we came up with this kind of model of what we felt was um, what, what is successful for us anyway as trainers. Um, and in a moment, I'll share what we mean by being a trainer, which we see that as a combination of a facilitator, a presenter, and an educator. But the rest of our talk today is going to be going over these areas that the more that we can, I'm going to start over here. Um, I don't know about, about y'all, but the, if I can have some self-care in the morning, so I did my meditation this morning, I make sure I have some water right here, Kunane and I checked in, because um, the last thing you want, right, is to be all frazzled coming in because you bring that energy into the space, whether it's virtual or not. So kind of that facilitator self-care being a very critical piece of how are you as an individual taken care of so that you can make sure I have a sign on my door that says presenting, please don't, you know, interrupt, uh, made sure that folks knew that and just try to make this space as, as comfortable for me so that I can then hopefully create a safe space for you. We talked a bit, I'm going to go backwards here, logistics, um, the trainer. So um, again, what, what are we going to bring to the situation? Then we have our group dynamics. We're going to talk a bit about what do individuals and people together bring in that we may need to manage both in the virtual and in the in-person environment. And then, of course, we have everything that you all bring to the situation, whether you want to be here. Maybe your boss made you be here. Maybe you're eating your lunch and you're kind of half listening. Maybe you're super engaged because you have a new job of facilitating and you're really hungry to get that experience. Um, and then the learning styles. How can we both as a facilitator and as participant contribute to a diversity of ways that people learn? So this is what we're going to bring through um, the next um, through the next uh, hour or so. I think we talked about some of this already. So I just want to kind of highlight um, uh, Kunane is really good, especially when we were doing trainings here, making sure that people got their email about what time are we starting? How many of you have been told we're starting at 8.30 and it doesn't actually start till 9 or 9.30? I don't know about you, but that, I'm an adult and I want to be able to make my decision. You don't need to cheat or, or fake what time it is to get me there on time. So maybe being really honest about that. What about parking when it's in person? Um, is there validation? 
Um, obviously, if their facility, people, I can't tell you how many times we've heard to, um, it was too hot, the room was too hot, the room was too cold, <laughs> there wasn't, we didn't like the food. So again, some of it's out of our control, but the best we can. Um, and then you always want your contingency plan. So I used to train um, as a trainer in the state of California where the state would fly me around. And I showed up one day with my box of materials for my 20 people and the room was not open and nobody could open the room. I did my training on a park off the park bench in the park next to the next to that building. So, you know, that doesn't always work for folks, but if, if the technology goes down, what's going to happen? Just so you know, Kunana and I have I said, if the if it gets unstable, I'm sending an email out to my team. Hey, please get offline because we, we're, we're stretched. Um, you know, if my slides don't work, Stephanie's got uh, an extra pair or an extra copy in case we need it. So again, it's just everything that could happen as a training, and I'm sure you all have some stories, can happen. So the more you're overprepared, it's also going to help your nerves because I don't know about you, but they still say that the number one fear is public speaking, um, and that doesn't surprise me. So how can we be overly prepared to help with some of that nervousness that we may have? So we can do all those pieces as a trainer and as a facilitator, but just remember that um, and it's taken, I've had my share of tears after reading a harsh evaluation or, but remember that they're bringing in all kinds of things that we have no idea. Maybe they had to drive across the island and we're in traffic. Maybe again, um, the topic we're talking about hits too close to home because we're talking about homelessness and they grew up on the streets. Um, you know, maybe, um, maybe they are, have some feelings about another training that Mir Kunane did and they're like, hey, it's that Heather girl again, what she gonna talk about today? And the reason I bring this up is the more that we can depersonalize training, because most likely, and even today, I'm probably not resonating with all 100 of you. There's going to be some of you that are like, yeah, that really is great. And some of you are like, yeah, I'm ready for Kunane. So don't worry, he's coming soon. So it's just, again, remembering that we have no idea what went on in an individual's life before they came to our training or our Zoom and to depersonalize it because they may be having something that has nothing to do with us and um, remembering that for every person that might not be having a good experience or probably somebody who's quiet who is getting a good experience. And the more that we can create a space where people can um, let go of this. So I um, just went through a training with Joy Yee, if you know her, um, she runs the practice center and does mindful forgiveness and antidotal healing. So at the beginning of every training, she does a chime in and she's like, whatever's out there, we'll be waiting for you after these two hours for just this moment. Let's take a breath and be here. Turn on your camera, stay with me and all of that will be there in two hours, but I want you here. Um, and I really love that invitation to kind of come in and be present, but then also understanding that many of you may get called away or have a call you have to take. So again, having that flexibility. So um, the last thing that I want to say before I do turn it over to Kunane, or actually, I'm sorry, yep, it's my last one, is that um, we're talking about facilitation today, but we really see this as an overlapping process that when we're talking about a trainer, um, which I consider, I think myself and I think Kunane would too, that we're training today and that embodies some facilitation. Um, so uh, some presentation and some um, education. So briefly, what I mean by these, this concept is that a facilitator is really that um, working with you all, right? Like, let me look at the chat. Let's look at what the mentee says. If we're in in person, we'll say, oh, that was such a great comment, Vicki. Um, tell me more about that. Or we may be looking out in the audience and see three hands up and we'll say, okay, first Stephanie and then Kunane and then Peter. Um, and as a facilitator, we're really trying to create an inclusive, engaged group, right, where we're really using our facilitation skills to try to draw in everybody, but also build upon each other so that the group really takes control. And my mentor often told me that a really good facilitator facilitates so well that they kind of back out of the process, the group takes it on, and it's almost like the group takes on the ownership and does it themselves, and the facilitator kind of backs away because really a, a, a really good facilitator facilitator, as she taught me, allows the group to then determine that process and running forward. So you're bringing in kind of those pieces. You often see those in meetings, strategic planning. You really want that strong ability to bring in people, synthesize content, and kind of build upon what people are saying. Then you have your presentation skills. So this is me talking really fast like this and trying to get you to understand me, which yes, I talk fast, or me talking a lot slower and trying to really emphasize a point that I am making. 
maybe it's my body language and really getting excited about something and using my hands or maybe it's like serious like oh the the ways that our community are really suffering during covid is so heavy so then you can really use both your verbal and nonverbal communication to again um make that you know make it more interesting but also engaging um, research really shows that for example the more inflections we have in our voice the more people are able to follow us i don't know about you all but a not a long monologue with a monotone voice is an, a recipe for at least me and i even get tired of myself um you know to, to feel dis disengaged so these are all of those techniques that you learn with how you project. Do you talk really loud? Do you want to be softer because it's you're doing a one on one? All of those pieces and how, again, that makes learning more accessible. And then lastly, what is the research tell us about how people learn? And this is what Kunane is going to start off with. Um, so these are those education skills. How do I distill information into a real clear, concise way? How do I come up with an acronym to help you remember something? How do I um, share information or translate information in a way from science in a way that again is really practical? So I think of a teacher in this way, like you've, you, I think we all have that teacher that we remember that was engaging and we wanted to learn. And then we had those classes that were like, oh my God, I don't know if I can sit through another lecture. Um, so these are all the pieces that we think about when we think about being a trainer. And again, you look at your own self and assess where am I with my facilitation skills? Where am I with my presentation skills? Where am I with my ability to educate? And where do I need to get some more support or um, get some more training myself? So I'm going to pass it over to the fabulous Kunane Dreyer, who um, is my favorite person to train with. So don't tell anybody else I said that. <laughs> um, and he's going to take us through some learning styles, um, really kind of getting into more of the skills um, of facilitation. And then I'll be back later to talk about working with challenging participants. Um, thank you so much, everybody. I'll turn over to Kunane. And Kunane, I can do the slides for you if that's helpful. Yes, why don't you do the slide and then when we get to our next mentee, we'll switch the sharing. So, um, aloha everyone. You know, I just keep saying, we're in a webinar um, mode and so I can't see any screen. So I'm looking at Heather and I'm looking at Stephanie and Maka's names as I, oh, oh everybody disappeared all of a sudden. Um, and so I'm going to just keep talking and it does it, you know, as a trainer, as a presenter, it feels a little awkward sometimes when I'm on Zoom and we don't get to see who else is in the room. I do know there's 110 people all together in here. So we'll just continue on. And I have two people sitting in my office. So if you see my head turn, it's because I'm looking for someone to tell me I'm doing a good job. So, anyway, so learning styles really quick heather sorry just if you could go back i just wanted to say people learn differently right and when we when we're presenting and when we're doing things we want to make sure we have the visual the auditory what people need you know do we engage them so there's reading and writing and then the the kinesthetic oh i'm getting good at saying some of these words so we want to make sure that we're trying to incorporate all of these sensory styles so that people can learn okay now next slide Okay, so here we go, everybody. Andragogy. I have to re. I had to Google to get the pronunciation about this. Okay, here we are, right? And really, what this means is the art and the science of helping adults learn. When we're much younger, right? When we think about our lives in school as young adults and um, elementary at that young age. We learn differently. And now as adults, um, as we mature, as we're going to see, that style of learning has changed. And if we're going to be facilitating or teaching, then we need to, as the presenters, as the facilitators, we need to understand or have these ideas in our head because it's going to look different than if I was a teacher in an elementary school. And I just want you to know when I was growing up, I wanted to be a teacher in an elementary, I wanted to be a teacher and here I am today, right? Just kind of rolled into this. But um, self-concept, right? As we um, mature, we move from being dependent on being told what um, is going on to some self-directedness, right? When we're learning. So we're moving from dependency to self-directedness. 
our experiences that we have had in our life. He's going to tell me something about, you know, oh, if you do this, this is what's going to happen. But maybe I didn't have that same experience. So I may not, I might, I might not pick up on that skill quite quickly, or I may have some doubt in my head, right? So experience sometimes will aid in Yes, I agree, and this that's worked for me, so it's going to work, you know, as I as I hear about it, or maybe my experience was different, so I'm not necessarily going to want to, you know, I don't receive that in the same way and learn about it. Um, readiness, right? As adults, um, the assumption of our of our new social role, our new roles. Period. Right? Do I learn about this because it's going to be something that I'm going to implement in my life? Or is it not part of my role? So then maybe I'm not as interested, right? So I'm not as ready to receive that information um, or orientation. Um, sometimes we wanna, right? It's like, I learned this, so I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna try to implement it in everything I'm doing. I'm gonna try to teach my staff. I'm gonna try to take it into my home or something. I get so excited that I have this new skill um, and I wanna problem solve and save the world with this, right? And then motivation. As we mature, our um, motivation to learn really it comes inspired from ourselves, right? In when we're younger or as we're growing, um, sometimes our motivation is I want to learn so that um, because I'm being told to do these things or I want to really impress someone else type of thing. But as we as adult learners we are being motivated to, because we have that desire to really um, grow as individuals is a good way for me to say that. And so our motivation stems out of our own desire to um, complete a task or to learn something new. Okay. Okay. So, right, how do we motivate that adult learner, right? What is it that this person, so there's 111 people in this, well, take out four. So that's 107 people, individuals watching this presentation. What is it that's gonna motivate each one of you? It's not gonna be the same thing, right? And so when, as a facilitator, we have to keep all of these things in mind, right? Of motivating the adult learner, right? Is it the social relationship? Is it our external expectations? Like I wanna learn this so I can do a better job so that my boss or the people that are gonna be part of my trainings or meetings will, will um, see me or will see that I've achieved what was expected, right? Our social welfare, right? Where will we stand in the community? Well, how do we want others to see us? Is it personal advancement if I learn these skills? I would be able to maybe advance in my role as my with my employer, maybe advance in my role in whatever community group I may be part of, right? So personal advancement. Um, it could be a escape or stimulation. Like I get excited to learn new things, right? Um, and it may not be that I'm gonna apply all of these things in my life, but I get to learn and then at some point I'm gonna say, oh. I know how to do this, or, oh, I heard about this, and it's a little bit more familiar, right? And then our cognitive interests, right? What, what gets us excited? Okay, so I'm gonna have a little sip of water. So here are some learning theories, right? The action learning. When we actually get to use a situation or a project or a problem to learn, right? We're, it's, it's, um, we have a real life example, and we may even be part of that situation. So that's action learning, right? Experiential learning, right? Being directly involved with the material being studied, right? So I'm learning, let's, I'm gonna learn how to make um, pahu drums tomorrow in Hilo, I'm going to Hilo. And it's not just I'm gonna watch this class, but I got to sit there all day for the next two days and I get to learn how to carve and sand and do this whole thing. And I'm gonna come out with these um, uh, product at the end, right? And that could also be um, 
related to our project-based learning, right? So a real world problem or task, and I'm going to go through this process, I'm going to learn about it, I'm going to have a completed um, outcome. And then our self-directed learning. So um, things that we're going to do on our own, um, not really being taught to us, like I'm not going to sit in this this presentation with Heather and Kunane to learn how to facilitate, but I'm going to start doing and practicing and have this learning experience taught by myself. Okay. So here, learning and Zoom. You know, when we first put this together, which we did a while ago, was before the pandemic. And so we, all of a sudden now, we moved to this virtual platform or virtual world. And we said, oh my goodness, it's a little bit different, right? Learning and, and doing this in per person versus doing it in a virtual realm or Zoom. And everybody's defaulted to Zoom. But, you know, it's harder... Um, to teach sometimes on Zoom or virtually than when we're in person, right? In person, we get to have that contact. We get to see people's faces. We get to um, engage, right? Call on people. Like in this webinar format, I can't see anybody um, or, you know, I can't add, add things like that. So it's harder um, than when we're in person. Right, and we know, and Heather mentioned this earlier, that there, we need frequent breaks. When you're on Zoom, um, right, to avoid Zoom fatigue, that tired eye, um, cola is sore from sitting down on the ground, you know, sitting on this chair for the last, some days I was on a Zoom meeting for 14 hours, it was crazy, right? So often breaks. I call it Zoom, Zoom but that I get Zoom, annoying. but. Yeah. <laughs> I laughed yesterday. I said, I'm going, to pla I'm going to tattoo that on my butt because I'm on Zoom all the time, right? And then how do you engage? How do you make it interactive, right? Polls, videos, pictures, stories, breakout rooms. These are the things that makes um, Zoom more interesting and engaging for your participants. Um, we don't get participate. You know, it's harder to engage, right? So getting participant feedback or input or just getting them involved, right? So having the co-host asking the questions, right? And so that's why we're saying, you know, put ideas in the chat. We want to engage you folks. We want to, you want to make sure you have a partner that you can bounce these things off of so that you're able to, one person is presenting, one person might be doing the chat. Um, and then be aware, I was just thinking about, that. oh my gosh, I'm talking too much. Long monologues get boring. I hope I'm a little entertaining as I go through these slides. But yes, how do we make sure we keep our people engaged? Um, and I think of Ferris Bueller, right? Bueller, 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 right? That whole thing, right? That whole monotone voice. And so I hope you folks are still engaged with me here as we go through. Okay. Facilitation. Here we go. I mean, for folks are, we're going to go back to menti.com and it is the same number again, the code, the 2513-6560. And the question that you're going to answer is what makes a good facilitator? And you have three spaces. So you can punch in three different words or statements on what makes a good facilitator. And I'm going to share my screen. And we're going to um, see what comes up. Did it come up what makes a good facilitator? It did. Okay, so if you folks can go to menti.com and use the code 2513-6560 and start punching in the just any thoughts or qualities or things you think of that makes a good facilitator. Oh, I have to open there. It's yeah. open. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Is it open? No. There we go. Is it open? Yes. There we go. 
And the words that you folks are putting in there are going to start popping up on the screen. So we'll get an idea of from everybody what you folks think a good facilitator is um, embodies. Go. Look at this. Knowledgeable, engaging, warm. So the fact that engaging is, is is large means that more of you are putting that in. So what's neat about this is that the bigger the word, that shows you how like how many people are using that word in the in the what is this called? A word cloud? Is that what it's called, Kunani? It is called I think so. I would have to double check. I could double check why we're off. But Menti, so this Menti, right? Menti meter is what it's called, has a whole bunch of different um, formats that you can ask a question and get responses and have it show up like this so people can see. Um, and this makes it engaging. It makes people, it also lets us know how many out of the 110 people are, you know, maybe might be multitasking. <laughs> But yeah, so this is such a cool thing to do. And you can set a timer or a countdown so that it will let people know when that's going to be done. Um, but yeah, but here, let me just talk about some of these, these words that have popped up. Engaging and engaging is still there a bit large in the middle. Knowledgeable, right? We want somebody going to listen. We're going to listen to that knows what they're talking about or has some experience in that topic. Positive, good listener. Um, enthusiastic and entertaining, right? Compassionate, authentic, funny. We have to have a little bit of humor mixed into some of this, right? In order to keep in the crowd engaged. So this is perfect. I love all these words. Respectable, experienced, genuine, warm. Look at this. How fun. Okay, so I'm going to close the voting and we'll go back to... Um, our slides and continue on. It's still moving, everybody. People are still submitting, I think. No, I closed them. Okay. So we're going to move through, um, get through these last slides, and then um, some of them I talked about, we talked about already. So we'll move through, and then Heather's going to talk about working with some difficult people. But you know, you need to, as a facilitator, we need to be prepared for anything. And Heather talked about that, right? Um, but accomplishing our goals and ob objectives of what today's training is, you're spending an hour and a half with us, we want to make sure that we're giving you what you are expecting, right? Knowing who's in the room, then their personalities, because right, some people, um, we have to mix people up in order to make sure that there's a nice balance within the space, right? To keep that energy in the space, right? Logistics checklist, I always have that. I want to make sure I know what's going on. Um, when you're on, you know, is your internet, the Wi-Fi, our air office has too many people sometimes. If everybody's on Zoom, we start freezing. So we gotta, you know, have plan, you know, get people off. And then always have a backup button because you just never know what's gonna happen, right? So this, we sent Stephanie our slides. If there was a, something we knew, somebody else is able to help us out with that. So always be prepared for anything. Um, who's in the room? Right, the dynamics at play. Sometimes we're doing trainings or meetings and there's funders in the play in the room that can impact the conversation that's going to happen. Right. So the dynamics at play, the personalities. Um, ask the group to share their motivations. Like, why are you folks here? Right. How do we build that? And we do that in the beginning of the meeting so that we can really get a sense of who's in the room. And then we can also um, help manage the flow and keep that energy going, right? Somebody put in here, helps you have a partner, like in this presentation, you know, Heather and I have been doing presentations for a while. We, we know how, we know where we excel and we know where we need help or support. And so we, it works out really well. Thank you for that. So who's in the room? Thank you. So next slide, Heather. Creating an inclusive environment. This is so important for us, right? Knowing who, and that goes to build off of knowing who's in the room, right? So that we can make sure that we are addressing, maybe talking about specific points that are um, 
experiences that people are, have had in the world so that we can make sure that they feel included, right? So playing the field for everyone. Equal participation. There's always that one person that knows every answer, wants to always, right? And is just more engaged in the process. So we wanna, you know, how do we bring out the voices of those who may be more quiet? And, and then how do we make sure that the people who are contributing to the training allow that to happen, right? Create that bonding between the participants, group buy-in, right? Own the process, right? And then the seating arrangement. I do, we do trainings where it's two, three days that every day they come back, I move the name plates around so that you're not sitting next to your buddy all three days. We mix the group up, that kind of thing, yeah. Oh, Tony, perfect, perfect. Do not use gendered language. We and our agency does that. We, we gender neutral, very inclusive, or just honoring somebody's identity and what they choose to, how they choose to identify. So perfect, right? Okay. So mobilizing the group, right? Encouraging questions, get people to ask the questions and ask people to ask questions, right? Scaling, what do we do to engage the group? What kind of questions can we ask, right? Um, encourage the participation. Um, virtual settings, you can do tagging, you could do this mentee, right? And chat, there's all kinds of little tricks that you can do um, in a virtual, right? And then support and encourage the quiet. So it's okay to be quiet. It's okay for people to, to allow that time and that space for silence right and just um one thing i want to pop in here and you probably have noticed this i've been on zoom where i start to go through each participant but then the the they move right so sometimes it can be really challenging to make sure that you've gotten to everybody uh so one tip i do is i have we can't do this with 100 people but if you have 30 you can say okay kunane answer this question and then you tag the next person and then they tag the next person mm -hmm. um, or you go down the participant list but don't try to do it based on the squares because you'll be crazy making because they move yeah and then you can't remember uh, and then and then i feel all old because i'm like oh tony and like, oh no tony already answered oh ken oh you already said ken twice so it's a lot easier to, to try to have them do it themselves yeah and then just briefly stacking um is a really great technique where you actually call research says that if you have your hand up that you're not actually really paying attention because you're so want to make sure you're seen so stacking is where you see several hands up and you would say oh i think i mentioned this okay kunane and then ken and then stephanie um and you can do the same thing in in, in zoom so um these are i just want to give those a couple concrete tips that are really helpful kunane how else have you called on people in zoom i'm just curious so you bring up a good point so with zoom though if you tell if you get people to use the reactions and raise their hand feature they get raised and they're kept in the in the order that they were raised so you can call upon them and another way is if somebody may not want to unmute and speak so you can encourage people to put their comments or questions in the chat as we're doing today and then just trying to make sure where if you do that then you have to be mindful to acknowledge the comments or questions that are coming through and you know today we have stephanie who's helping to monitor along with um, us depending on how many screens or what your setup may be it's easy it could be easy or hard to make that happen but that's definitely a way to get people Oh. oh, and Ken just wrote, you see that? Um, that's a great idea. Sometimes in Hawaii, it's fun to reach out by island and to draw people out. Ooh. I think that's a great idea. Right. A common factor or something and to encourage and, and go in that order. That's a great idea, right? That's how we do these things. Okay. Is it still me talking? It is still me talking. Just a couple more slides. So active <laughs> listening, that comes up even virtually. We have to, in virtually, it's almost like you have to be more because you have to actively listen to what's being said, but you kind of kind of monitor what's happening with your, with the people in what I like to say, the Hollywood squares, right? So mirror, paraphrasing, tracking, eye contact, even on Zoom, you can have eye contact. You can be looking at the person who's speaking and people know when they're being acknowledged, even non-verbally, right? Our reflection or reframing, a re a reframing right? This is what I heard you say, um, our nonverbal cues. I was on a meeting the other day and I could see two, I could tell two people were texting each other 
because um, they were both laughing and then looked down and laughed and looked. And I was like, "Excuse me, I want to know what you guys are talking about." You know, it wasn't a work meeting, but it was like, "I want to know, right?" I mean, so we can see some of these things. Um, what are some other things that people think of when we talk about active listening? Anybody wants to type in the chat box? All right. Well, I don't see anything coming up in the chat box, so Heather will move along. We want to be mindful of time, right? 1.30. Oh, we mentioned something like, good idea, Kunani. That's right. Acknowledging the person who said the comment or shared that. Yeah. What is tracking? Can you go back? Sorry, Heather. So tracking, tracking is again, making sure that you're aware of who has their hand up, but also who said what. So that way you can say something like, like, let's say Kunane. So as Kunane said earlier, or as, you know, Ken typed in the chat earlier, it's a way to kind of, again, build community because you're linking and tracking everything together. That's my understanding of what that, what that means. Being respectful. And then Diane, you put it in there, didn't hear the question. Is that something that um, you're asking me that you didn't hear my question or a comment saying, I didn't hear your question, right? To get them to re repeat it in a way to make sure we respond correctly. Right. Or another great one is that's a really good question. How, what do people think about that? That's one of my favorite techniques, right? Because as someone wrote in the chat earlier, you always want to acknowledge when you don't have the answer any of us, uh, we have to be really honest and say, oh, you know, let me get back to you only if you're really going to get back to them or let me check. Right. But I don't know about, about y'all, but the moment I have somebody who tries to BS their way through an answer is the minute they lose me <laughs> as a student. How about you, Kunani? <laughs> no, that's so true. And it's okay to say, I'm not sure. I don't have the answer to that at this time, but we can get it for you. Yeah. Okay. So here we go. Manage our time. And we want to you know, plan your agenda, value everyone's time, you know, keep people updated uh, what's going on. It's like, okay, we have another 25, 28 minutes and we have a few more slides to get through, da, 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 right? So we are, everybody understands and it's on the same page when it's time. And for us, it's really honoring people's time. Start, you know, we start on time, we end on time, everything like that. Yeah. Here, working with a co-trainer, Heather and I do been doing trainings for a while, but it ha we need that because then you have somebody who's being that observer, one person facilitating, one person looking around the room that can you know jump in when needed, right? That life preserver that we have at the bottom. They can also bring their experience. Um, we can check in with them before, during, and after. They're always, always that support. Um, have a trainer that you compliment each other and um, and then assign the roles and responsibility. Who's going to be doing what, right? I was responsible for mentee. Heather's responsible for moving slides. The, who's going to be doing, you know, who does what in each training or and each section even as you break that agenda up. Um, and, you know, it make sure where everybody's okay. It's okay. Like Heather jumps in, I'll jump in. We need that support. Yeah. Um, here we go. Abbott and Costello. <laughs> Right, Kenneth, yes. Okay. Flexibility is the key to access, success. You know, if you expect your training to happen in a very specific way, in a very specific order, you're going to have stress, right? You have to adapt on the fly. Yesterday, we were planning breakout rooms. This morning, we said, okay, we can't do that. We've got to do something else. The topic or the discussion may take you in a different direction, and you just go with it, right? The logistical issues that you got to do your training now in a park next to your office building because it's not it doesn't we don't have the key right time time so prioritize what is left ask the group this we have 30 minutes these are our topics what would you like to cover right that's a great way to do that right 
Because the last thing I think we all want is, um, I, have you ever been to a training where the trainer runs late and then they get rid of the brakes, which is so unfair, right? Because they are the one running late. So again, as a facilitator or trainer, we have to own that pieces. And so the more that we can have an extra couple of slides or an activity, if we have too much time, but also know or ask the group what to get rid of, because we don't want to, we can really lose um, the group if we compromise their well-being for our agenda. Um, and that also means running late as well, which is not, again, respecting their time. So it is, again, a, that partnership um, that Kunani has been talking about. So here's some uh, trainer tips. Never let them sweat. They don't know. They don't know what's going on, right? So you don't have to worry about. I always say um, it's like dancing a hula. Dance by yourself, and they won't know you went the wrong direction, right? Because you're all alone. So it's your show, right? Be ready for anything and everything. Be engaging create experiences that are very thoughtful around the topic, right? Be neutral, when to advocate, when to educate. And again, here I said, it's okay not to know. I don't know the answer to that, but let me go find that out for you. Whether you can do it during the training or have to email or follow up later, that's okay. People are understanding when that happens. Okay. Um, virtual trainings, what makes them more interactive, right? Using the polls, Benti, poll everywhere, people using their smartphones, right? Get them engaged. Miro, Miro is a great thing. So a Miro board, you can, it's almost like you're in the room with them, right? It's like you're doing a whiteboard and you're having them participate with post-it notes and all kinds of things. And you can get all of this set up so that when you're in your Miro board, it's almost like you're in a conference room and some, and you're getting people to participate in the same way because everybody could have access to the Miro board. Um, I'm just showing know, an example, Kunane, of all, this is a meeting oh, that yes. me and Kunane did recently. And I know it's going to take some time for you to play with it, but everybody can have access. Then they use these little sticky notes and then we can do a, a, a workflow and then we all brainstormed um, and you can do all of these pieces. I think this is a free, this, this version was free, but if you pay, you can get more access. So at first I was a little scared of it, yeah, Kunane, but now we're really utilizing it more and more as a way to interactively have meetings and, and have people participate in the way they used to with like actual sticky notes. Yeah. And then of course, you know, using videos, PowerPoint, things like that. However, be ready if your internet crashes or something like that, what do you do next? Um, games like cahoots if you ever if you've heard of that but cahoots you can get people to participate it would be shows up on your screen and you can do games or contests make things really fun okay. so actually i think that we're going to try to show a video to see if <laughs> if this works so we're transitioning here um, to talk about working with some challenge when we have challenging participants um, in our sessions. Um, and so we found this cute little video that hopefully will work. And again, the more that we can, you can, so this we download ahead of time because you don't want to be dependent on Wi Fi. Um, and that is uh, hopefully you all will be able to hear this. Uh, Kunane, will you let me know if you're able to hear this one? Welcome to the Dealing with Difficult Participants session. Sorry, we... If the goal of facilitation is to help people acquire knowledge and skills, then a difficult participant is anyone whose attitude prevents others from meeting that goal. It's the facilitator's responsibility to neutralize these roadblocks so they and others can learn. But how to get them on board? Let's identify the different type of behaviors we can encounter in a training room. The latecomer, the one who is always late. The preoccupied. The one who is always worried about everything. The argumentative. The one who is always questioning and confronting, willing to be heard. The prisoner, the one who doesn't want to be here, participating in the course. The introvert. The one who never participates and is afraid of being exposed in front of the rest. The domineering. The leader and popular, the one who gets all the attention from the rest. The know-it-all. The one who knows everything and wants to get the recognition, always trying to make a point and hardly allowing the rest of participants to have the initiative. The skeptic. 
the one who doesn't believe in anything, and challenges the facilitator to convince him or her. The socializer. The one who wants Sorry. to talk to everybody, is extremely social and has difficulties to focus. The bored. The one who shows no interest at all on the subject. The confused. The one who is always confused, does not understand the activities or the instructions. The disruptive. The one whose intention is to boycott the session, by bad behaving. The apathetic. The one who does not show empathy, seems uninterested and does not seem to be motivated by anything. The sleeper. The one who falls asleep at the session. So. What would you do to gain the engagement from these difficult participants? Oops, sorry, I didn't actually mean to do that. Okay, so we're going to just very quickly, I think on the next slide, again, I'm going to have you go to Menti. Um, and we want you to talk about the ones that are the most challenging for you when you have done uh, presentations or trainings. Again, whether that is, these are mostly been about in person, but I think we still can see some of this um, online as well. So I'm going to stop share and have Kunane go ahead and put that back up. Um, and he can share with you the uh, results of. So what we're asking you to do is to um, rank, I believe, the top four that are challenging for you um, and working with folks. And we'll kind of see um, where that goes. Did you open the, did you open it, Kunane? Yeah, oh, there we go. So we got the results coming in. Right now we have a tie between the argumentative and the shy or quiet one. Got a couple of people in the chat. Thank you for sharing, Jennifer, around. All right, so it looks like we still got a little bit of a race going on, but it looks like uh, the winner that is the most challenging for most of us is the argumentative. Somebody who may be um, not trusting our information or challenging us um, or trying to undermine us. Um, and so we're actually gonna talk a bit about what to do with um, very quickly. We could spend a whole training just on this. Um, but quickly, I think for argumentative, I think the biggest one is we don't want to buy into their dynamic, right? If we get into a debate or a back and forth with the argumentative, we're going to lose the rest of the class. Um, and I think we all, I think you all would agree with me that no one participant is more, or, or no one facilitator is more important in the whole group process. So the other piece is that kind of elephant in the room that if we recognize this, probably everybody else does, and they're as tired as we are of it. So we also need to find a respectful way to engage it to take care of the rest of the, of the group, but not in a way, right, that is going to necessarily um, make that person um, even more angry. So let's go through and walk, uh, look at what some of the research says about each one of these. So um, for shy or quiet, again, we don't want to assume that they're not engaged. So some, sometimes some of the smartest, most present people are just quiet. Um, they just may need to be more comfortable talking one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so it's really nice to do pairs or breakout spaces. Um, the other thing I love to do, not in 100 folks, but if you have a group of 30, you could really go around the room and it's called a round robin where you ask each person to talk. Um, and again, they can always pass, but that, and again, is allowing them a place to contribute. So smaller groups, breakouts. Um, the other thing you can do is like have them journal themselves about their own answer. Um, and then the, my other favorite one is let's hear from someone we haven't heard from yet. Um, and really kind of, and then being really kind and being like, oh, you know what? We've heard a lot from you. I'd love to hear from somebody else that we haven't heard from in a nice way. So again, the challenger, we kind of talked about that a little bit already, um, but one is, um, is, is, is acknowledging that for many times we may not be the expert. Um, uh, and even if they are the expert, then we can say, so help me understand, well, what is your understanding of the definition of this? And so let's talk about this, or again, put it back on the group. What do other people think? People think? 
oftentimes if the person is not trusting you or trying to undermine you or agitate you, they're actually going to respond better if somebody else in the group um, is the one that responds to them. This is also the reason that you really want to have group agreements, because this is where I have at the break gone to a, someone who's challenging and saying, hey, you have a lot of great points. However, you know, I've been, I'm concerned that you're not honoring the um, one diva, one mic um, rule that we agreed to. How can, how can I help you participate in a way that's still honoring of the group agreements that we all agreed to, for example? And that's what we do with the dominator, step up, step back. Um, and then one of my favorites is, is you really kind of, um, um, as my mentor taught me, instead of trying to fight against somebody who's um, being a challenger, you want to kind of partner with them. So I even might say, oh, Kunane, you have such great, why don't you read this next section? Or why don't you talk about this slide? Because you have so much to share. So it's also kind of uplifting them and allowing them to be a teacher, but just make sure they, they give it back to you. <laughs> Um, whether you have somebody unfocused or not, it's really good to do what's called transitions. So again, my mentor taught me that I'd come in like from Kunane and say, so Kunane talked about this. Now I'm going to talk about this. So again, that we're reiterating everything as we go along and summarizing um, as we go along to kind of help people. The other piece is we re be repetitive. Um, people say, or the research says that people will retain less than 10%, um, for example, of what we've talked about over the last um, hour and 15 minutes. So the more that we can reiterate or have take home messages at the end, um, the better it will be. We talked about the know it all. And again, just invite someone to participate. I think I've already shared most of those. So um, we're trying to get um, to the end here so we can leave some time for question and answers. Um, but one thing Kunana and I will do is that we will debrief and we really uh, support and, and believe, that, especially when you have a co-trainer, that you debrief. So him and I will talk and be like, well, what worked? What didn't? Uh, hey, did I step on your feet when I popped in, which I think I did one time. Kunane, I'm sorry. I think I interrupted you. Um, and so we'll talk just really openly and give a plus delta what worked, what didn't. Um, and then, you know, at times, and Kunana and I are trying to mentor some of our own staff as trainers, him and I will audit a training and then we have a little tool where we say, how was their facilitation? How was their, you know, question answering? How do they do engaging the group? Um, and then of course we read all the evaluations you give us. At the same time, I'd encourage you again to take them with a grain of salt um, as a, uh, because we don't want them to undermine our own confidence. Um, and um, there's almost always gonna be an evaluation in each batch that um, you may not agree with, but using a peer then, um, Kunane's, I really value his opinion and I'm gonna take it a lot more seriously. So we, I think you all are probably very experienced in giving feedback. Um, so I'm not gonna spend too much time here, but we do wanna be really clear. Like I might say something to Kunane, like you did a great job on this slide, giving this example. On this other slide, something I would have liked to have seen is an example again, so you didn't just read the slides. You didn't just do that Kunane, but that's an example of how I might give him feedback. Um, but again, remember, especially after training, sometimes it can be really exhausting and we may not be in the space to do that. So this is how we do our feedback, um, really trying to be um, descriptive um, and then give opportunities for just suggestions. And um, I know I keep talking about my mentor, but I've been thinking about her a lot lately. She's no longer with us in this world, but I often uh, tap into her. Um, and um, what she often told me was that feedback is like a gift. You accept it, but whether you actually use it or not is up to you. Um, and I really liked that saying. So we're gonna end our time with you today and we're gonna try one last interactive way to engage. So what I would like you to do is get ready into the chat for those of you that can. And if you could type in a couple of words of one thing you're gonna take away, but do not hit send or hit return yet. Um, and then what we do is we wait everybody and then we say go and then everybody puts it at the same time um, and it's called chat confetti. And it's just a way to equalize um, and see everybody's comments at the same time. So again, I'm gonna ask you to go into the chat box, type a couple of words of something, one thing that you'll take away, um, but don't press the send yet um, for just a couple more moments. So we'll wait till everybody has their chat in there. So Heather. Yeah. While well, people are typing into for our chat confetti, um, there was a question in the chat box that I was the okay. Q and A that I responded to, but I just thought I'd share it with the group. Right? Is it appropriate to ask the person right to look up their question right if we don't know the answer on their phones while we move on with the presentation? and let us know when they found the answer and maybe discuss it. My response, for me, I've done that in the past and it's a great opportunity to um, inspire learning as they're researching this. And if you, you know, 
answer this in a group setting, then maybe some other, you could encourage others to also, because then it would lend to the conversation that you would have um, based on those responses. Yeah, I think my only caveat to that is you want to ensure it's a reliable source, right? Um, yeah. There's a lot of disinformation on the internet. Are they getting it from Wikipedia or the Centers for Disease Control? Um, so that's the, my, I totally agree with you, but we want to make sure that um, whatever s s citation that they're using is, is, is known to have accurate information. Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> but no, very, very good. That's good. Okay, we're going to ask you to go ahead and hit return um, in the chat and have everybody putting in, oh, look, see, it's kind of, kind of fun. Everybody's in there at the same time. Um, so again, uh, it really helps to look at some of these. Kunane, do you mind just kind of reading through some of these out and read some of few of them out loud? And yeah. then um, why we're doing that, if you all could ask any other questions in the Q&A box and we'll have Stephanie help facilitate the last 10 minutes of Q&A, but yeah. Oh, so we, oh my goodness, they're coming up so quickly. So great role modeling, be real, use interactive tools such as Mentor and Menti and Miro, the feedback list. Um, the right to pass for a safe space, right? Fun, how to interact with difficult participants, um, the use of the polls and the games, um, helpful tip to depersonalize training and adapt, right? Chat confetti, divas, divas. My world where it's filled with divas, so we have to always, you know. <laughs> Different adult learning motivations, right? Mentee, the engagement, Miro, Oh, so many. Never let them see you sweat. Amen. Amen. How many times, Kunane, have you been like, oh my gosh, I bombed that. I did that. And the people in the audience are like, you were awesome. They don't know that we were struggling or that I forgot a slide, right? Or that Kunane, I don't know, whatever the issue was. So people are so much more gracious than we are to ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> Do not compromise others' time in order to um, meet our agenda, right? Meet our agenda. It's like for real. Feedback is a gift. How to deal with different personalities, right? It's showtime, right? It could be room is filled with 20 people. And I always like to say 20 people and 50 personalities. <laughs> That's good. Being president open as a participant and as a facilitator. Exactly. Yeah. Um, great tips. Thank you. Oh, my. My word that haunts me, a drug, it's gaji. I had to, it's a drug, I, I don't, don't make me do that again. No. <laughs> Be overly prepared. Yes, yes, we were. We have to when you're doing these. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, Kunane, we have one we question. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Okay. I didn't mean to cut you off. Um, no, no. And then mine is blown with Menti. I love Menti. Um, and, you know, all of these new tools that are out there, these virtual tools, right, for some of us, some of us, me, my age, you know, technology is not something that I grew up, you know, very familiar with. It takes myself a while to get comfortable with that. So practicing, like I did a whole practice run today with um, one of my staff in here on with the mentee to make sure it would function properly. So we have um, a question that says, I was on a webinar once where the presenter's phone kept ringing. Oh dear. And private messages. So make sure that your phone is on vibrate. Yeah, Kunami. Um, and private messages kept propping on the presenter's shared screen viewed by everybody. Oh, that's What's so it? funny. That is funny. It's like a, so that's more like a hot camera, right? Instead of a hot mic, I guess. What's the appropriate response to let the presenter know? Um, so I'll take a stab and then Kunan, I'd love to hear your thoughts. So that, um, so that actually happened to me once where accidentally I didn't realize that my shared screen, um, that I had my teams open and we use teams cause it's, it's HIPAA compliant and the thing popped up. And so somebody, did, some, what, somebody just wrote to me and they said, oh, information up. Um, and so I actually really appreciated that someone basically, uh, chatted me and said, you have something on your screen. So that's what I would do if I was a panelist or if I was a participant, I would just go to the panelist and say, hey, some information is showing that you may not wanna be have seen. But Kunane, what would you do if you were in a webinar and somebody was showing inappropriate information? I would message them privately that, you know, cause a lot of times these things are happening because we're unaware that technology, right? Sometimes is our friend and sometimes can be our worst enemy. That might be one of the, that's one of definitely one of the situations. Yeah. yeah. And then their phones, um, if you can hear like the vibration or the dings or something, it's always trying to put their 
telling them, you know, if I put their phone on silent versus, yeah, during that. Yeah. yeah. But definitely I would, I would, I would uh, chat the, the panelist. Um, that happened in my, my last hot mic experience. That's actually how I found out, um, which was somebody uh, uh, chatted me and I was very grateful for that. So good question, good question. Uh, the next question says, I'm wondering how to deal with negative people that are always complaining about things they had to do. It promotes negative comments. It happens in a lot of meetings that I go to where there's this one individual who's always complaining. You wanna do that one first, Kunane, and then well, I can I'll add start in. with, so I'm very solution-based. So I would try to maybe then, instead of just listening or hear, like, what can we do different? What is it, what is the solution to that, right? How do we flip it to be a little bit more positive, um, right? That this is a challenge and what can we do to address the challenge or what is the solution? And then even more so, what can this person do? What is his solution or her solution or their solution to the situation that they may be um, having the negative comments about? Yeah, I think I similarly, and, and I've even said, so a bunch of the trainings that Kunane and I do are for the alcohol and drug abuse division for certified substance abuse counselors. Um, and so some, we ask, why are you here? And I would say at least half of them. Yeah, Kunane are like, I'm here for the CSAC credits. Um, so then I almost make it a joke and I'm like, oh yeah, no shame if the only reason you're here for credits, you know, we still want you to be engaged, but we get it that you're here for the CEUs. Um, and so I try to kind of turn, and not that they were complaining necessarily, but just turn it into a more lightness of like, it's okay that you're mandated to be here. Given that you have to be here, what can we do to make this as engaging of, of an experience and a learning environment for you? Um, and then I would do, um, so usually the way that I do challenges is I try to do it respectfully in front of the group um, and say, hey, you know, we've heard a lot from you. Do you mind letting hear from others? Or, oh, that's a really good comment, but you know, you interrupted somebody, let's, but really nicely. But then I also have no qualms on a break going to someone and saying, hey, I'm getting the sense that you're really unhappy to be here um, and that you, you had to be here and that you don't think this is a good process. Um, what would it take for you to be able to put the, just to put that aside for just a moment and, and, and have an opportunity to be open to some of the solutions that others are suggesting or whatever. Um, so I don't know if those were helpful for the person that answered the question, but those are some techniques that it sounds like Kunan and I have both used um, effectively. But I think it's kind of like, um, in, I'm a social worker and I've often been talked about a process comment, which is where you comment on the relationship, you know, between you and the person, like maybe the person's looking at their watch. So I may say, hey, it looks like you're looking at your watch a lot. Are you in a hurry? I feel the exact same way about a facilitator or trainer. If, if you're being noticed by it, the group is being noticed by it. And the group, especially if it's an ongoing group or a reoccurring group, they're looking to you as a facilitator to say, how are you going to take care of us? How are you going to make sure that this complainer over here doesn't sabotage all these great things that we're trying to do? So again, it gives an opportunity um, for us to remind ourselves that no one person is more important in the group process. Um, oh, Diane's got a question. What's a hot mic? Yeah, hot mic means that you left, you're, you're not on mute. Um, so that's, uh, it could mean either that you're not on mute at a, I think it came from like a press conference where like politicians were, they could be heard over the microphone, but I use it on Zoom as that, that I forgot to mute and somebody can hear me. Yeah. Okay, I think we're at time. We have time for one more question if anybody has it. Otherwise, I'm going to ask Stephanie to come back on and talk about follow up steps, which I think she already did. But just to reiterate about getting um, the information that she needs by Monday, if you want to get your CEUs. It doesn't look like there's any more questions coming in, but um, I do want to say this has been so enjoyable. I think you and Kunane can see that from the comments. I'm getting text messages about how fun this has been. So um, very, very wonderful. I'm wondering if in, I don't know if this is possible, but if in one minute um, you could maybe talk to, um, I think a lot of our attendees could be direct service providers. And I think a lot of what you folks have talked about can be um, applicable to not just trainings, but maybe running group. groups. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like running groups at their clinics or wherever their setting is. Um, so could you talk a little bit about how they could take what they've learned and apply that to groups that they might be running? Sure. sure. Um, so I think the first thing for me is, is understanding group dynamics, which we didn't go a lot into. Um, but there's uh, some theory that's pretty well established that talks about groups coming together and they talk about that they form, they storm, they norm, and I'm 
blinking on the fourth one, meaning that it's really normal for people to come in with their individual experiences and expectations. Um, and so you kind of bring people in and then creating safety, right, with those agreements and whatever so that everybody can participate. But then there's actually a really normal storming part that groups have a group development. It is normal for groups. And we've seen that at our own agency where because it's almost like they're it's almost like at the whole testing authority and adolescence. Is this group really for me? Is it really safe here? Are you, can I trust you? Can I trust my co-members? And so there's sometimes those um, I don't know if it's arguments, but disagreements. And then if you can really provide the safe space to allow that to happen in a safe way, it goes into the norming, which is then the group takes on its own culture. Um, and they really, you know, they really are bonded and there's not there's no group like that group it's never that group's never going to exa exist again and how do they kind of enhance that um and then from that is kind of like how do you then harness all of that to also honor when the group dissolves um, because then when people are really bonded um they're going to having some kind of ritual when you kind of close groups i found is really important so those are just a few things that came to mind for me um kunane i think you covered most of it i mean you you really covered a big chunk of this for me it doesn't, it's, if I'm sitting on a webinar like this or even a Zoom meeting, or if it's in person, it really comes down to the group dynamic and then really hearing what they have to say and then being flexible enough to go in the direction that you need it to, that the group is taking it and bringing it back to where to reach and achieve the goals of that group and what should be happening during that hour or whatever time and how do we accomplish this and so as the facilitator of a group you're kind of like steering the canoe right you got to get them you might it might go yeah. to the left honor that and then get them back to the to where we're going that's a great analogy because you are the navigator right a lot of ways a facilitator is a navigator i like that that's great Kunani. Was that helpful, Stephanie? Yes, I think that was great. Thank you so much. So we are a little bit over time. Um, so I will wrap up now, but I wanna give a big mahalo to Heather and Kunane for being our presenters today. Um, as a reminder, the training is being recorded and will be available on YouTube um, by Monday morning. I will be emailing out a Mahalo email that'll have a link to complete the evaluation, which does need to be completed by uh, close of business on Monday, May 24th. And you must do the evaluation in order to get your continuing education credits. Certificates will be emailed out by close of business on Friday, June 4th. Um, lastly, please stay tuned for details on our upcoming summer webinars. And um, I want to also let everyone know that I very soon will be heading out on maternity leave. So don't be surprised when you get to see Maka, who is my counterpart behind the scenes. So she'll be helping facilitate our webinars, um, but I will be back in the fall. So again, mahalo to Heather and Kunane, mahalo to all of you on uh, Zoom and mahalo to Maka behind the scenes. Take care and we'll see you at the next training. Aloha.